be Jewish government and de facto government. Okay. Um, in customary international law, we have de jure government. Now, de jure governments are governments with an elected parliament, Congress, legislature. Okay, so they have the power to make laws, man made laws. Okay, and they can make any law series of laws, rules, regulations, ordinances to protect vested interests or special interests. Okay? Now, de facto. De facto literally means it has been in fact a sovereign independent government since antiquity for thousands of years. You know, for thousands of years, um, it's been there. It did not need or require a man-made law to recognize, recognize its validity and authenticity. That's the difference. Now, indigenous communities in North America, Australia, New Zealand, they've been there for 40,000 years. They are de facto governments. They are de facto sovereign governments. Then de jure comes there, like in Australia, 1788, eh, Susie? 1788, they come to Botany Bay, they unfurl the Union Jack, and next minute they've proclaimed uh, it as a colony. De jure. But that doesn't take away the de facto rights and claims, privileges, and duties, and obligations. Why did de jure succeed and not de facto? You got to think about the East India Company. They came as a trading company to rule over four, five hundred million people, and that's the only trading company in the world that managed to get a private army of 250,000 troops to control a subcontinent, India. So what's the secret, folks? Arma in armatos sumere hura synod. And that's Latin, a doctrine, which means the taking of arms or the using of arms against the armed is allowed in law. We'll talk about Arma in Armato Sumere Hura Sinunt, the next lesson. Does that help with the de facto de jure? Yes, that's very true. And you got to remember 1648, the Treaty of West Westphalia. I call it Westphalia. Not W E S T P H A L I A, but the Westphalia. F A I L U R E. How's that? <laughs> All right. Thank you.